main shortcoming is simply this. The interpretation is completely contentless. I'm not exaggerating or trying to be rhetorical. It is not that the interpretation is too hard to believe or too non-intuitive or too outlandish for physicists. It is just that the interpretation actually does not say anything whatsoever about reality. I say this despite all the fluff of the science writing press and a few otherwise reputable physicists who seem to believe this vision of the world religiously. For me, the most important point is that the interpretation depends upon no particular or actual detail of the mathematics of quantum theory. No detail, that is, except possibly on an erroneous analysis of the meaning of a, quote, quantum measurement introduced by John von Neumann in the 1930s, which is based on a reading of the quantum states as if they are states of reality. Would many worlds work if quantum mechanics were based on real vector spaces instead of complex ones? I would say yes. Would it also work if quantum mechanics used a different product structure than the tensor product? Yes. Would it work if quantum mechanics didn't obey the Schrodinger equation? Yes. And so it goes. So one could even have a many worlds interpretation of classical physics. As David Wallace, one of the most careful philosophers of the many worlds interpretation, once reluctantly admitted in a conference I attended. Is there more to this? No, sorry, no. That's in this, or is there more? Uh, now we, we can just. Uh, I, I will ask you again later. Yeah, yeah. Um, Unfortunately, I hope that David will kind of confirm what, what it was. And uh, just my, my comment, and then it, you're welcome to have some other comment. Again, uh, it is, maybe I think it was expressed also in the conference, uh, that many words does not lead to new physics. Many and I think it's an advantage, because current physics is, uh, agrees with theory of experiment until uh, 12 digits. It's the only problem, it's uh, nonsensible. If we do not accept many words, the only way to accept that the current physics is sensible is, is many words. So I'm not trying to use many words to get a new physics. David Deutsch, uh, he got some counter computation, whatever, it helps him with his ideas. Maybe it helped me to think about interaction free measurement. But again, the main kind of philosophical thing, many words solves me. Uh, the problem is that every single word theory has action at a distance. So, maybe a few comments if there are. Uh, there is more, essentially, he also he had a previous postdoc, and he, uh, he gets a similar message, but for five minutes, we'll, 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 we'll get to uh, see him. Um, maybe it's do it after this, and let's, yeah. Let, let's, let's put this together. More than 10 years ago, when I was an undergraduate, I thought that many worlds was obviously the correct interpretation. And I was genuinely puzzled as to why other people didn't find it completely convincing. My confidence in many worlds was based on the following two postulates, which I personally found pretty compelling. Number one, hidden variables do not exist. And two, quantum dynamics is linear. Let me take a moment to explain why I like these postulates. Firstly, despite great efforts, no experimental procedure has ever succeeded in finding additional variables that would render the theory deterministic. When the theory tells you that something should exist, but you just can't seem to detect it experimentally, history shows that a good rule of thumb is to try postulating that it's not there. Think of absolute motion, for example. Secondly, the dynamical equations of quantum mechanics seem to be linear meaning that if you take a quantum superposition of any two solutions to the equations, you get another solution. This is actually kind of unusual in physics where most familiar kinds of dynamics, think fluid mechanics or gravity, are described by nonlinear equations of motion. When some unexpected or peculiar feature of your theory is supported again and again by experiments, history shows that's a good candidate for elevating it to a postulate. The funny thing is all these years later, I still stand by both of these postulates. But back in those days, I also believed in a third postulate, namely, quantum states describe states of reality. It turns out that if you want to have postulates one, two, and three, it's very hard to escape the conclusion of many worlds. So what's wrong with that argument? Well, 
nothing really if all you want to do is explain the existing theory. And as an undergrad, that's all I really cared about. So many worlds seemed perfectly good to me. But as I progressed in my physics career, I became more concerned with the problem of going beyond quantum theory. For instance, trying to extend the theory to include gravity. And when you're in the business of theory building, it's not good enough to stop at an interpretation. You have to then use the interpretation to guide you in building new theories. And this places a whole new set of demands on the interpretation. Not only must it explain what has come before, it must also provide strong constraints on what else might be possible. Looking again at those three postulates, it's kind of obvious that the first two are extremely powerful because they place strong restrictions on the possible theories. By contrast, the third postulate is notable for not being based on any experimental observations. It just expresses a philosophical standpoint. And its only purpose in the system seems to be that it leads us to many worlds. So is many worlds good for something? The basic test of the strength of any principle is to take it as a postulate on its own and see what it implies. For example, if we postulate that some theory must have many worlds, does this requirement also force us to conclude that the theory's dynamics must be linear or that there cannot be variables that predetermine measurement outcomes? No, it turns out it does not imply either of those things. So as a postulate on its own, it actually doesn't have much power at all to constrain the possible theories. Here's another test. Does assuming many worlds make the other postulates at least seem natural? In the case of linearity, the answer is definitely not. A priori, if many worlds existed, we should expect to be able to visit them or at least observe them directly. The only thing that actually prevents us from doing so is the linearity of quantum dynamics. In light of many worlds, the linearity postulate looks kind of conspiratorial. If the worlds are really there, why should nature conspire to hide them from us? They seem no better than hidden variables, as far as I can see. All of the heavy lifting of constraining the set of possible theories is really done by the postulates of linearity and no hidden variables. Many worlds provides no additional help and in fact just seems to get in the way. Remember, there's no experimental basis for that postulate three, which is what leads to many worlds. It's a purely metaphysical assumption. Why cling to it? Maybe there's some other postulate three prime that we could put in its place, such that the combination of one, two and three prime leads to a new interpretation, which does have the power to restrict possible theories beyond quantum mechanics. Shouldn't we investigate that possibility? If our goal is to build theories beyond quantum theory, then many worlds is useless at best. And at worst, we could describe it using Einstein's words, which ironically he used to describe the Copenhagen interpretation. It's a tranquilizing philosophy, a gentle pillow for the true believer from which they cannot easily be aroused. So let them lie there. Uh, just one. What? What do you? Ah, you want to go first? <laughs> I'll keep it quick. It's, <laughs> it's not paying my travel. <laughs> so uh, I, I just uh, just what? What? What do? You? If ah, you want to go first. I'll keep it quick. It's, <laughs> it's not paying my travel. <laughs> so uh, I, I just find it extraordinary that he thinks many worlds are a postulate. Um, and the other main point is the point about the quantum state is it's representational. Now, sure, you can, what's the point of representational? Well, answer, it gives you a representation of reality. So you could say, oh, I don't want a representation of reality, and that frees me up do lots of new things in quantum gravity? Well, maybe. I'm not sure that that is a good methodology, though, in science. Uh, so I want to, to relate to something specific he said about the linearity. And, um, and this, the, this linearity also holds for the Liouville equation. So if we only know the Liouville equation, we could argue that classical physics is also linear. And we could perhaps invent, I mean, that's what they're saying. We could invent a many worlds interpretation of classical mechanics and 
argue that all these points in phase space are actually real. And uh, yeah, okay, so that's the point they make. I want to uh, emphasize this by recalling uh, a long time ago when I was involved with quantum chaos, and people were saying the classical system is chaotic, so it must be nonlinear. Then how come it can be represented in terms of a linear equation? And uh, they were working out how does it really happen. And quantum chaos is interesting. But the same interesting questions arise in the context of the Liouville equation. So there are people who worked out for the Liouville equation how chaos comes about and so on. So the, the very fact of linearity doesn't really distinguish between classical and quantum mechanics necessarily. Yeah, I just to, to follow up on your last point, one of the differences, though, is that in the Liouville equation, you don't have the same Hilbert space structure. You typically have left and right eigenspaces, which are very different in general. Usually the right eigenspace is analytic and smooth. The left eigenspace is often, for chaotic systems, extremely uh, mathematically irregular. It involves distributions. So, so, so even though it's true that there's a linearity, the physics is extremely different, and, and, and the mathematics points that. So that was just my own comment to, uh, to follow up on your point. My, my other comment is, is I'm sympathetic both to Chris's uh, thoughts here and also to the other, I, I forgot who, who, who else this was, Jacques uh, Pilar, Pinar, yeah. So I thought that was eloquently stated. Um, I, I just wanted to, to f follow up. Did I hear you correctly say, Lev, that because this is somehow theory independent uh, in the sense of Chris's uh, statement, that's a virtue for you? Did I understand that correctly? I'm not sure it's the same question, but my reaction to this story is it's not the situation uh, that Do uh, uh, Everett invented many to find something new. Everett, and at least for me, I don't like many words, but I look on quantum mechanics as is, and I cannot believe that this is a theory of the world, because it has action at a distance. And this is my only way to resolve it. And then I have this elegant, pure things which I studied and I teach in university. And it has no action at a distance, and it agrees with all my observation. It's not I don't want to get some. I want to, but physics is great. I think physics. Uh, to, pe people were wrong hundred more than hundred years ago that finish is fin that finish is finished. I think now we are very close to this. And today people are afraid to say this, and I think it, by and large because of this measurement problem. And many words solve this measurement problem. And the only solution with reasonable, which I see, it's many words. This is why I accept many words. So all the, they say, just it's just otherwise. I, I might agree. I, I cannot get from many words anything new. Yes. Yes. I'm not sure. I, 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 reality, it's the same thing. It's what is real, you know. This is real that I feel my pain, or real ontology. My physical theory should not have action at a distance. The, you know, the, the fact that I perform quantum experiments that there are some correlation with pain. This is, I don't. Reality. We have to, we have to cite Maudlin here uh, um, with uh, oh. There is no reality, but thank God, it's local. I'm so sorry. What, what do you say to PBR, Pusey, Barrett, and Rudolph? Um, this would seem to suggest that if one's got the very crudest of views that there are causal processes taking place in the world, Whatever there is, it better have the complexity of the quantum state. What, what do you say to that now? Thanks for the question. Um, 
the PBR theorem is based on postulating the existence of these other parameters. They, they lump them under the lambdas. And they can be something like hidden variable, but they could be this quantum state themselves. I think my, my response is simply to deny these lambdas exist. If you deny the lambdas exist, you're not bound by PVR. And so this would be, for example, Chris Fuchs' uh, position that, that uh, if you f view them as states of knowledge, then this theorem is simply not applicable. I, is, if I don't understand, if, if I understand correctly, I think PBR would, would concede that point. But P, it, P, P, yeah, no, so, so look, it's, it's important. So PPR, they don't postulate the thing. They say, if there's any intermediary between the state preparation device and the state pre measurement device, then it must have the same complexity as the quantum state. So if you deny that there's any such intermediary, uh, right, but this is a rather extraordinary position where there, there's nothing that goes from the state preparation device to the measurement device that causes the measurement device to act as it does. Uh, I'm just uh, surprised that the, uh, uh, say that the quantum states are real is considered a postulate. I mean, this is not a postulate. I mean, uh, what he's actually saying, uh, and also Mark Rubin saying, is uh, adding a postulate, say that they are not real. And then we don't have to take a, uh, anything seriously. And then we have not to worry about it. I mean, we don't need to uh, possibly that anything is real. I mean, this is the standard uh, uh, starting point of view. Like, uh, as physicists, our job is to describe what is real. And I mean, if we're uh, worry about the non-real stuff, I mean, what, what, what is this that we're doing? I mean, we are not uh, describing reality. And I also want to tell a story. But, uh, I mean, I was uh, I argued about this with Jacques uh, like several times, and he agreed with me actually that uh, our job is to find out what is the real things. And then I say, well, uh, what, what on earth then are, are you doing with, with cubism? And then he say, no, 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 cubism is uh, on the job of uh, describing what is real. No, 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 cubists are realists. Uh, they just haven't got to it yet. I say, well, but I mean, this uh, it started like uh, 20 years ago. I mean, and, and I'm supposed to believe that they are going like to now finally develop some ontology. They say, yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're working on it. We're working on it. We're going to put something in the archive soon. Yeah, this was two years ago. Nothing happened since then. Okay, let's move on to uh, F uh, Philippe Granger's uh, contribution. So I looked at the conclusions in your preprint program, and unfortunately, I don't see any hope for reconciliation because our premises are too different. In my view, there is only one macroscopic universe with fundamentally non-deterministic features imposed by contextual quantization of the properties of subsystems. The wave function, or state vector, is only a mathematical tool for calculating probabilities relative to, those, relative to these non-classical and non-deterministic features, something like the binomial Poisson or Gauss laws for classical probabilities. Unitary, unitary evolution of isolated subsystems and Born's rule can be deduced in this framework, CEG, this paper. In this framework, there is no action at a distance, but rather predictive incompleteness, CEG, this other paper. I, yes, it's a different paper. I followed the talks before lunch. You had no time to show my contribution on infinities, no problem. It would have been poorly received anyway. Sounds like, sounds like sour grapes to me. For more details, please look at another paper. But a, but a young guy at the bottom of the room gave what I consider to be the right answer to your question. Why is there no consensus on NWI? This is because almost all physicists are convinced that a probabilistic description is a basic physical requirement in QM. I can give many physical reasons and explanations why it is so. This means that a probabilistic description is the starting point on which the theory must be built. Psi is a tool, not a rule. Then the quantum way to calculate probabilities does look weird, but still it is a fully eligible, non-classical probability theory. And this weirdness can be justified by starting from empirical evidence, CEG, another paper. As a consequence, a measurement does not split the world more than just throwing a dice. The classical versus quantum difference is before that in the way probabilities are calculated. Well, I just 100% agree. 
if there's no probability in uh, the average interpretation, then I think it's doomed. It will never achieve any consensus. Uh, uh, that's a conditional. Of course, I think there is probability in the average interpretation. As I understand, and uh, the philosophers, most of philosophers, before quantum mechanics, thought that the scientific theory should be deterministic. And if we fail to have a deterministic theory, then we have to go to theories of nature which are probabilistic. And uh, the quantum theory made revolution because people don't know. The only way to understand it was probabilistic until Everett. It took too, lo too long time for Everett to come. And uh, I think Everett provided us a deterministic uh, option to, to have a theory of nature. Aurelien Drezé. I would like just to summarize briefly why I think there is no clear consensus concerning the NWI. Besides the extraordinary nature of the theory leading to claims like a, lack, like a lack of parsimony or the violation of Occam Razor, which I found unscientific and unconvincing, the most problematic aspects of NWI are related to three interdependent issues. First, the problem of the definition of the MWI. Second, the nature of probability in the MWI. Third, the claims concerning absence of non-locality non in the MWI. The first problem means that we don't even agree what is the MWI. If this is the theory of Everett, then we have only a pure wave, but some would like to introduce a many Bohmian theory where many trajectories, a la Bohm, exist in different parallel or separated universe world. Why this should not be a legitimate theory? Advocates of MWI don't agree on that issue. If they don't agree on the definition of MWI, I guess, then they face the issue of the probability problem. That tells that a pure wave theory, a la Everett, cannot justify probability, i.e. unlike Bohmian or GRW theories do. In the bare MWI, there is no probability, but only a mathematical measure that is not unambiguously related to chance and randomness. This is a dramatic situation for the MWI, in my opinion. A many Bohmian approach could solve the issue, but I don't think that advocates of the MWI would get a consensus on that point. If they don't solve the issue of, prob of probability, advocate of the MWI cannot rationally speak of Born's rule. Therefore, how could they even speak about locality or non-locality? The EPR Bell scenario, or even uh, GHZ, rely on clear measurement protocol associated with clear definition of probability, even probability zero or one. The absence of consensus on probability implies an absence of consensus on non-locality as well. I hope this summarized my perception of the problem about consensus in the MWI. Uh, well, it's um, rather interesting to see this because um, <clears throat> I've had quite a lot of contact with Aurelien recently and um, it led to my uh, developing a hybrid uh, many worlds um, pilot wave theory, which is in my most recent paper, which was what my poster was referring to and what my talk was sort of preparing the ground for. Um, and in a way, is, so he says um, that a many Bohmian approach uh, might might solve this issue. Well, I've attempted to solve. Uh, that issue in just uh, the way he's suggesting, but uh, Simon is attempting to solve it in a different way, which wouldn't involve hidden variables, his, his branch counting things. So, uh, uh, so uh, well, no, maybe Simon would like to say something about that. Um, but, well, there we are. I mean, I think, and, and just to go back to something um, earlier, I mean, the. Uh, Something I didn't say about the um, the the, uh, the cubism. I I thought what what was being said could also be it could be used as uh, as a criticism of uh, of retism as a, a pure wave theory because the issue about no hidden variables um, uh, obviously uh, the uh, pilot wave has hidden variables and. Um, it has a different sort of it's a different sort of uh, realist theory, but um, 
so that the complaint of the, the cubist might be symptomatic of a different sort of claim state or could be a sort of an aspect of the, the complaint about to which pilot wave theorists have about many worlds that a, a pure wave theory isn't adequate, it needs something else. Well, I, I think he makes it too easy for himself because, I mean, what kind of interpretation is that, that will then, uh, if you look at the first point there, uh, the problem of def, uh, that we don't agree, that's the problem what I want to address. I mean, is, is there any interpretation or will there ever be an interpretation where all the proponents of something quite similar will agree? I mean, obviously not. So that's a far too strong requirement, period. Yeah, I'll, I'll somewhat um, sympathize with that. And I, I, I think with a theory as radical as many worlds, um, heavens, uh, it's going to take a great deal to build consensus. I mean, I, I think that at Oxford, over a period of 15 or 20 years, we did build a fair amount of consensus as to what the many worlds, the Everett interpretation is, um, as to whether it's really viable or acceptable is another question, but there was some consensus. So if you talk long enough and, and hard enough, you can pretty well hammer out, I think, some agreements here. But I just do want to object to one thing, and this is otherwise very well taken, these points, but the notion that you give a definition of world. We're not in the business of giving definitions. We're in the business of interpreting quantum theory. It's not an, an, an any attempt to impose posits, hypotheses, new principles, definitions. I, I think this just detracts and weakens it because the strength of the Everett interpretation is it's just taking quantum mechanics seriously with unitary evolution and the state is representational. <laughs> so that, that's it. So no, no space for definitions. I think, uh, thanks, Simon, that taking quantum mechanics seriously is many words. This is very much what I'm thinking. But definition, I, definition of a concept of a word, for example, I think it's very important to come to understanding and to kind of consensus, at least within believers. Uh, because I saw in some uh, places that people consider this, that when I perform a measurement, then the word spread with velocity of light. And for me, it's complete nonsense, because this is completely different concept of a word. And of course, then uh, if we so strongly disagree about, now we have to put some definition, maybe to put different names for different objects. For me, a word describes the whole three-dimensional space and what's happening there. And uh, so, and now there is a, there is this other idea, separable quantum mechanics. Great. But it looks like um, we cannot even discuss if we agree or disagree when our concept of a word are different and we use the same word for a word. So. <clears throat> okay, so that, that may be a, a good answer to that and that stop using the word world if that's a misleading one and go back to Everett's branches. Uh, seems to me uh, then uh, the obvious choice. And we, we should just say this is the many branches. I mean, many worlds was sort of perhaps good because it gives a lot of attention, people listen, but on the other hand also oppose. So uh, perhaps it's in the long run uh, really a bad word. W word. Maybe I could make a friendly suggestion as an outsider that I think it would be helpful to make a kind of taxonomy of many worlds theories, to, to have a tree with the different branches of different beliefs about the nature of these worlds, these branches, are this collapse dynamical, 
Do we have to put in some kind of propagation of world splitting? Uh, I, th I think having that kind of clarity of distinguishing the different views would be a good starting point if you want to try to develop a, a sense of what's wrong and what's right. And then we'd need the super technology to recombine the branches. <laughs> the, the purpose of this workshop was exactly this. And uh, Charles is silent, and uh, Sam is silent. I, I want, I want uh, do they agree that this is completely different objects, or they seek? Or I would like to hear what, what you think because about this issue. Well, yeah, um, very respectfully, Lev, when, when Sam did his talk and, you know, he, he proposes a way in which the branching structure can occur in a completely Lorentz invariant fashion and completely localized way, and he suggests the strength of his theories, and we can also have arguments why this branching is just a property of physical system getting entangled with nearby physical environments, so it really touches base with the, the whole decoherence um, program, uh, but in the Heisenberg picture, when, after, after his talk, you said, but we don't need that. We have, universe, we have global branching. We have global branches. Worlds are global. G worlds are non-local. And Sam just basically looked and said, well, that's precisely the problem I'm trying to solve. But it felt like you were not appreciating the fact that um, we can make improvements in, in, our, in, in the details in which the branching occurs. And again, these improvements are not based on stuff that we add to quantum theory. These improvements are based on taking quantum theory to be fully unitary quantum theory and of course, taking into account the fact that we couple with a lot of degrees of freedom and so that we cannot get decoherence outside of the picture and that um, these degrees of freedom inhibits our ability to reinterfere. So it inhibits the ability to rebranch. And so this is, this is the precise sense in which the branches become, for all practical purposes, uh, autonomous. And and so, yeah, I think that there is, well, we are going to pursue this research program of investigating how, you know, fully local unitary quantum theory has to say about local branches, how they recombine. And I know I made some brief comments about the Bell theorem, and I think I've been misunderstood by almost everyone about this. It felt like people were thinking I had some relativistic statement, uh, but me, uh, when Alice and Bob re-meet after a violation of Bell inequality is an example of a rebranching. And what I have in mind here is a 20, 2014 paper by Frank Tipler where he investigates by a violation of Bell inequality in the Schrodinger picture. And we see that the big, there's a big sum of terms with Alice being obviously a large system entangled to her, to her Bell state. And, and Bob also, but since they violate Bell inequality, they're not measuring the EPR pair. They're, they have a, a bit of an offset in the measurement settings, which creates four term. And then when you see that when Alice and Bob recombine, you see that with 85% um, probability, ampli well, square amplitude, Alice and Bob recombine in a way that they violate Bell inequality. So you, you, you fully follow the calculation in the Heisenberg, in the Schrodinger picture, and you, you see the, the, the rebranching. This was a paper in 2014 who sort of motivated me to, to pursue that. But then the thing is that in the, in the Schrodinger picture, we run quickly into the, um, what's it called? Yeah, well, what Alice spoke on day one or day two, the sort of eternal ambiguity of what we call a world when we have uh, Alice that has branched. Do we take Bob Reddy to to be factored out again, or do we take Bob ready to be uh, distributed, and then we have global worlds? And I think that this this whole ambiguity and and what counts as branching is um, solved in the in the Heisenberg picture of doing it. 
Charles, uh, I want clarification. You didn't give me an answer. I understand what's branch. You, you decompose universal wave function, and then in a branches in which all macroscopic objects are well localized. This is my branch. I don't understand what is your branch. This is, I, I don't understand the definition. I don't know what it is. Can you, because you said I perform a measurement and then it spread with sp spread of light, somebody else perform measurement. W what are the branches? Uh, what is the definition of a branch? Well, I, I, I agree with Simon that it's not, we, we should not aim at a very precise definition. And uh, by the way, even you are not in the business of doing a very precise definition of branch because you will involve stuff like macroscopic and then I'm going to ask you, well, what it is, and then you're going to sort of tell me, well, this chair, or you're going to come up with some stuff that I don't know exactly what you're talking about. So if, if you read carefully that David Wallace chapter 3, he gives a very, very convincing construction of autonomous structures in the multiversal wave function that are have, for all practical purposes, their interference abilities, um, uh, they, cannot, they can no longer interfere. So they start to evolve on their own in the multiverse, and you can call this a branch. Now, exactly what it is, exactly th th does this electron uh, should count into the branch or not into the branch, I personally think that it's a feature and not a bug that it is actually not super crystal clear because it is this uh, sort of blurriness which at some scales permits recombination of branches that we call quantum interference. Like right now, there is so much um, <laughs> antiparticle, particle pair cre uh, creating and annihilating and all those, if you want to put a web of what the multiverse is like, you'll say, oh, well, was that a branch rebranch or was that nothing? Or, and I think it doesn't really matter. It's, 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 the aim of the game is to make sense of unitary quantum theory, which includes all the time those branch, uh, branch and rebranch. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not in the business of trying to make super clear what is a branch. Uh, but um, when we make a measurement outcome, and this is where maybe we will rely, when we make a measurement outcome, um, the measurement apparatus is a device which has been precisely um, built to amplify um, the, the signal of the, the small degree of freedom, which will create a cascade and make a macroscopic superposition. And then you and I will agree that when we measure a quantum system, we get into a sum of macroscopic terms. Okay. Uh, yeah. Long conversation. But <laughs> um, so, in the spirit of the ta taxonomy that uh, Andrew talked about, um, so I feel like the first level of taxonomy would be really a division between levels, uh, left's version and and some types of uh, some type of local branching version, where I think you, you are really interested in. You have a completely different approach, left. I think you just say, I have a standard Everettian, uh, completely local description of the whole universe, but. That's all you want to say about this. And then you go to a different level and then you say you want to to give an account of your experience. And you use then in this term, uh, in this level, you use the term world. And I think the, the, the branching or, or the worlds in, in the local picture are something completely different. Because I, I think what you mean by world is actually really, um, you just say everything is there, nothing disappears, nothing collapses. So it, it's just something like like things just evolve it's not components of the wave function don't disappear so everything is present so like in the spirit of what pair also suggested maybe one could be called worlds the other could be called branches maybe something like that and then to continue the taxonomy i think the next step which which i would like to understand is then inside this 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 part where you have the local branching i would really like to understand the difference between local branching theories based on uh, explicit QFT calculations, for example, and the general uh, Oxfordian decoherence picture. Because to me, it seems like they are really close in the sense that I, I feel it would be easy to reconcile the, the relativistic branching out of the, of the decoherence with an actual physical description based on quantum field theory. To me, it seems like this is w essentially will be the same thing. But apart from this, there seems to be another difference in these two versions, namely related to the way that explanation is made. While one, one, 
your version, you you are very uh, you emphasize that the explanation is completely local. This other version has this non-separability, which has some explanatory function. So this would be for me the next level of taxonomy. First level is. You, do you use left approach where world is used to connect it to my experience versus world in the sense of you keep locally just all components of the wave function and the next level of taxonomy would be what is the explanatory, is the explanation completely local or does non-separability play a role in the explanation? 